Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in on this Saturday morning. Um, we are joined by Dr. Poonima Nagaraja, a very esteemed and very charismatic individual. Um, so I'll just start by giving a brief about the conference and what SWITCH is. SWITCH India, it is, it's a healthcare organization run by medical and paramedical students and personnel from across the country. It was founded in 2016. We started with a small health camp uh, in a village, screening only 70 patients. Today, we have branched into initiatives of physical fitness, mental health, and conducted dozens of health camps and awareness campaigns in urban and rural areas. And we've collaborated with various organizations to conduct medical workshops, seminars, and ed educational field visits. IMPACT, which is this conference, it's a first of its kind two-day mental health conference, which is an initiative taken by Inside Out, the mental health unit of SWIFT India. All those delegates who have joined us today on YouTube can post their comments and queries on the YouTube chat box and our speaker would be delighted and happy to answer all of them. So for today's webinar, we are joined by the ever so dynamic and charismatic Dr. Neelima Nagaraja. She is a consultant psychiatric and psychotherapist at Sydney Hospital since the past 12 years. She has obtained her MBBS degree and MS in psychotherapy from Siddharth Medical College in Karnataka. Dr. Purnima is skilled in psychological assessment, child abuse support and counseling, training, and psychological wellness. She is an experienced teacher of mental health at undergrad, postgrad, and doctorate levels. Dr. Purnima is much loved and respected by her patients, all of whom receive a great deal of personalized uh, care from her. She is also a child and women's activist, motivational speaker, and a personality development expert. We are extremely honored to have you here today, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so today, ma'am will be speaking to us about caregiving in an unequal world, dealing with grief and loss. Grief is a response to loss. It is a deep emotional and mental anguish that is a response to the subjective experience of the loss of something significant. It can be overwhelming, sometimes even disrupting your physical uh, well-being. Today, Dr. Nagaraja will be shedding some light on the emotion of grief and how we can tackle it in a healthy manner in order to power through our lives without disturbing our inner equilibrium. Uh, the floor is all yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd first like to thank you all for bringing me here. I've been reading up about Switch India and I'm extremely uh, impressed by the kind of work you're doing and I'd like to help you in any which way I can uh, to um, empower you to deal with mental health issues. Um, it's never easy and you know as we all know there's such a huge stigma and um, it's not easy and like we said it is an unequal world. Whether we're talking about e e economic um, and inequality, caste inequality, um, creed inequality, uh, there is there is so many levels of inequality in the world and um, to deal with this is not easy so uh, absolute uh, um, appreciation and applause to you for what you're doing and um, you know keep going more power to all of you now today uh, the topic is uh, caregiving in an unequal world but first let's describe what an unequal world is for example if you're talking about health seeking behavior like health seeking behavior is when you go to seek help you have a stomach ache you have a fracture you know you go to seek help there is a gender inequality right there okay it starts right there okay um, the woman is one of the most vulnerable genders here women homeless children these are extremely vulnerable genders because you don't know how to go because you're financially dependent on somebody else and he decides whether you go or the family decides whether you should go or not but then do you think that men have it easy actually no because uh, you have to man up okay so you can't show emotions and uh, you're not supposed to show even pain you're not supposed to scream if you've broken your arm because you know you're not a man and you know what kind of a guy are you i mean you know you're so effeminate so it's not easy on anybody to you know to seek health okay whether it is mental health or physical health or emotional health it's not easy our social structure is such that uh, we have created inequality on many many um, strata for example um, a child a homeless child falling sick where do they go or say um, if there is somebody a destitute you know or your roadside beggars where do they go 
Nobody even wants to touch them because they're dirty and unbathed. So when we're talking about inequality, and it's not just in this country, it's, you know, if, if you go to a foreign country, if you see a homeless person or a tramp on the road, you would avoid them like the plague because they're dirty, they're unwashed, they're probably violent, maybe they have firearms. Nobody wants them. So the degree of inequality, you know, doesn't change geographically. It's the same. Whether you're talking about, say, uh, a child who's been, um, say, sexually abused, Nobody wants to help such a child. Nobody wants to even address the issue. And nobody wants to talk to a child who has lost her parents. If there's a bereavement in the family, all the older people are busy consoling themselves, you know, and consoling the, the key relative who lost that person. But nobody thinks that there are children out there watching everybody crying and lamenting their fate and that the child also needs support. Because we believe there are their children, you know, they'll grow out of it. So you see, inequality is more here than you know anywhere else, and the social strata definitely um, contributes to it. May I have the first slide, please? So all of you are medical professionals out here, uh, and um, we all know that right from you know your first year of medicine or nursing or whichever course you're doing, you will see people uh, experiencing loss. So grief is a series of intense physical, spiritual, and psychological responses that occur following a loss. Um, it's very normal, and it's, it's natural, and it's absolutely necessary. So uh, when we try to you know, go through the stages of grief, it's an adaptive response. Because if we didn't do that, you know, it would become complicated. We are bottling it up, and it can lead to several uh, psychiatric issues. The next slide, please. So what is it that, you know, grief actually does to us? Now, nobody wants to discuss this again. Is it grief? What does grief do? You cry, that's it. You know, weak people cry more. So these are, you know, society's, uh, you know, ideas about grief. But the actual function of grief is it turns your outer reality into an internally accept. Okay, my father passed away. He's not there. Okay, now what do I do next? So it turns an external reality into an accepted internal reality. And then... Over time, it lessens the emotional attachment to the lost person or object. Now, this is a very dicey statement here uh, because uh, sometimes emotional attachment never goes. You never stop missing that person. You never stop grieving for that person. And it becomes a, a very complicated reaction that we have. Um, it also makes it possible for the bereaved person to become at attached to other people or objects. So again, this is a very dicey statement because if you lost your father, it's very likely that you'll not get attached to another father figure, right? And if you do, it may not be the most healthy relationship. So the tasks of grief, you know, it's uh, their acronym is T-E-A-R. So T is to accept the reality of loss. This I completely agree with. Uh, e, experience the pain of loss. Yes. A, to adjust to the new environment without the lost person. And R, to reinvest in the new reality. Now, this makes more sense than, you know, the psychological versions of the functions of grief. This makes more sense. And I'm sure all of you will also agree to that, that um, loss is a reality we really need to accept. And that's the hardest thing to accept. And the pain, um, each person experiences their own level of pain. And the duration of pain also is individual. Adjusting to new environment without the lost person again. Um, over time, we do it, you know, but uh, sometimes adjustments become difficult, especially, say, if the person we've lost was the main earning member of the family or the person we've lost was a very young uh, person, like, say, just in the prime of his or her life. One never gets adjusted to an environment without them. Uh, and reinvest in the new reality. Yes, we do it, but um, how we do it is, um, again, varied. The next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, okay, it, this, thanks. So uh, just, just to point out to all the youngsters out here, and I know all of you are very young, uh, that grief isn't just for death. The minute we talk of grief, bereavement, you know, we just deal with death only. But um, see, the loss of a friendship, your best friend doesn't want to talk to you anymore your uh, um, best friend has had an accident, your best friend has left city and gone to another country or another state, okay? Losing your community, all of a sudden, you know, you have uh, left your uh, 
community and gone somewhere else to another country to make your life up and you know it's suddenly you're you're the familiar language the familiar um, people around you are, are missing their familiar culture around you is missing okay um, missing all the certainty that you once had mom and dad um, right there you know cooking meals for you dropping you in college and all of a sudden you're in the strange country trying to do your undergrads tough courses and you have no friends out there nobody to talk to except you know the occasional phone call to your parents okay um the other one is you know when you know you question your own judgment should i be doing this or did i do wrong have i have i overstepped my uh, limitations here so when you question your judgment also you feel you feel a deep sense of loss also when others question your judgment what the hell were you thinking when you did this or when you said this um, what the hell were you thinking why did you take this particular subject in your college when you know you're not good at it so or what do you mean you want to be an astrologer or an astronomer i had a young lady who came up to me and said she wants she was inspired by kalpana chawla and she wanted to be a, you know um, an astronaut and um, she also wanted to study astronomy and because she's studying astronomy she also wanted to do astrology because she was very curious um, as to how you can you know make out the nature of a person based on your natal charts the mother thought she had psychiatric illness and brought her to me and i said what's wrong if she wants to be no but we wanted to do her btech and settle down and get married so when you deal with mediocrity and your judgment is questioned you know it definitely tells on your mental health and the girl had you know all kinds of doubts she said doctor am i am i crazy am i am i stupid to you know want to do all these things and uh, it took me a long time to convince her that she's okay and took me a longer time to convince her parents that she's okay but all said and done today she's in nasa and she's doing a, an internship there and it took me a lot to convince her parents and i know if something goes wrong in in that career choice i'm going to bear the brunt of that judgment so when people question your judgment they you know it it definitely has mental health uh, connotations and uh, at sometimes you know you need to kind of realize and release who you once were okay like there are people who just for a peer group will do anything right i know people who um, indulge in risky behavior uh, alcoholism uh, experiment with the uh, drugs psychedelics just to be a part of the group or there are people who will be different from who they are like you know act very rich or act like um, you know be very snobby or bully other people you know and so many of us have experienced this in school also where you know you people gang up and bully you then all of a sudden you realize and say what the hell what am i doing here i mean do i really belong to this i mean here i am putting on all these you know these masks and faces do i really belong here and when you realize that and you say no this is not who i want to be i want to just let go of this um and i want to be who i was and i i need to search uh, again to find out who i was this can also cause um severe moderate to severe and sometimes very severe mental health issues um feeling lost and unanchored i uh, don't want to point fingers but uh this generation is more lost than my generation was and the generation in between you and me and the reason is uh you know we had just about four professions uh, and you just take one of those and survive <laughs> and uh, uh but today there are thousands of uh, things that you can do including you know like uh being on the net and uh, you know you can make money off the net and you know if somebody had told me that when i was studying I don't think I would have finished my MBBS. I was like, okay, open this and sit here. But um, you know, influencers and all of these things. You see, there are so many things that you can do. So this FOMO is very uh, uh, heavy on this generation. You know, there's a fear that you're missing out on something. Fear that you need to do something. Uh, the need to have your fingers in a great many uh, pies to do a lot of things and to do them well. Okay, so you feel very unanchored. What am I doing here? You know, you get hate mail for you know probably doing a a video without makeup, or um, or if you wore makeup, then you'll have more uh, hate mail. So there are tiny things that set people off these days. You know, we're you know we we live on this very very thin thread called life, and so when you feel unanchored, when you feel lost, there's a deep sense of uh, loss that you feel. Okay, and then okay, the other thing is losing the traditions that you loved. um it could be celebrating diwali or it could be you know playing holi you're in a strange land and you know unless you uh, contact 
people of your community probably doesn't get done. There are laws in some countries which prevent you from doing all those things. So it has to be very clandestine. So whether it's a tradition, a practice, a habit, all of these things, you see, can, can cause grief and cause the same sense of loss that we feel when we lose somebody or when somebody passes away. So can we go to the next slide, please? So this is a lot of psychobabble that I've just thrown in so that uh, because being medical students, you'll probably get all of this. There's a lot of psychobabble here. So I just run through these slides. So the types of grief. So one thing is the uncomplicated grief, which is called the normal grief. Again, I object to this word normal because none of us are normal and there's no, there's no definition for the word normal. And I know for sure I'm not normal. And um, so here the grief reaction is, you know, it's just like a physical condition. You can have a chest pain, you can have body pain, you can have headaches, you can be crying. Okay. There's a common, you know, etiologic factor that is, you know, that you've lost somebody. Okay. Uh, or somebody around you has passed away. So you're all medical students. All those who start their clinics, you know, would know that when you go to a, a hospital, one minute you say, bhaiya kaise ho? You know, and the person is talking to you. The next morning you come back and that bed is empty. So that itself, you know, can be extremely toxic. You know, all, all of a sudden somebody dies. And um, I remember during my medical college days, there was this little watchman's son who had, uh, um, uh, who, who, who was suffering from uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. And um, I was the one who was giving him his chemotherapy because he would take it only from me. In those days, we didn't have chemo ports. It was every time it was, you know, uh, an injection. So this is way back uh, in the 80s. And um, this one time, fortunately, I was on casualty uh, duty. And uh, he said, they said, like, Ramu's calling you. And I ran to the ward. And by which time he had a retinal hemorrhage and he was bleeding through his nose and all that. He was dying. And then he was calling out, Didi, Didi. And I held his hand. It was almost as if he was waiting for me. Okay, I held, I held his hand and then he passed away. I wouldn't stop crying. And even now I tear up when I talk about it. My professor was watching me from the corner. You know, he was doing this and just watching me howl. I was howling. I was not crying. I was howling. Okay, because I was so attached to this boy for a whole month, I was taking care of him. And um, so he came and he held me by the hand and, he, you know, he took me into his room and he said, what are you doing? I am crying. And then he says, no, you don't cry. Um, I know it's, it, it can be traumatic, but, um, you know, you are a doctor. You can't do this because you're howling louder than his, his own relatives are howling. Probably they have, and I said, probably they have come to terms with him because he's been suffering for a year and a half. I haven't come to terms with him because I've been dealing with him, playing with him, getting food from home, doing all kinds of things. And uh, I don't think I can come to terms with, uh, you know, come to terms with this. So as, a, as a, a, a lesson or, you know, I thought it was a punishment, but anyway, he said it was a lesson. He posted me with a lot of these terminal cases who would die. I would just would establish a friendly relationship and the patient would pass off. Over time, I think I learned to take it in my stride. Although I don't think I have, you know, being a doctor and being a doctor for 30 years, over 30 years, I don't think I can ever come across uh, a time when I have not grieved for the person who has died. You know, and maybe I don't cry and howl like I did with that boy. But for sure, I feel terrible for the next few days. And in, in psychiatry, we deal with suicide. We deal with self-harm. We deal with uh, people who find life extremely unbearable on a daily basis so it can be you know sometimes you are on edge you're wondering like okay will this person do this and so you try to make yourself available for that patient whenever they call it may be sometimes a false alarm but you're always there okay so what happens is a functional impairment for a period of time and i was functionally impaired myself i couldn't go back to the ward and work well see the bed bed number 12 i remember it i was like howling like that you know and i, I just start howling loudly and all the other patients would get a little distressed, okay? So I, there is distress and inability to function normally. And I'm sure every one of us in this pandemic has experienced uh, this kind of uh, reaction from uh, people around you, your neighbors, people in your own family. I think all of us have lost somebody or the other very, very dear to us. Could be a friend, could be friend's parents, could be our own people, neighbors in, the, in, you know, in your apartment. So these are extremely difficult Period, times for us and um, grief uh, is something that we have experienced grief for you know losing our normal lifestyle grief for uh, losing uh, somebody close to you or known to you grief for you know all the people out there who are dying who you may not even know but grief for the fact that oxygen was not available when we needed it most 
so there, there's different kinds of grief that we have all experienced some of us have cried some of us have like tried to be stoic about it but we have all suffered from the stress of this the next slide please yeah so uh, the other one is called um, you know dysfunctional grief okay so there's a persistent pattern of you know a lot of grief that you can't reconcile with it's like for example the bereaved person may have you know the need to endlessly tell and retell the story of loss without subsequent you know healing i have a mother who comes to me she's been coming to me for a year and a half her daughter committed suicide because she had problems with her husband she blames herself because she was one who kind of convinced this girl hamare india mein forcing ko convince kehte hain so <laughs> she was kind of pushed into marrying this guy and it turns he turned out to be quite an abusive person she blames herself it's been one and a half years she pays for a two hour session okay she comes in and she retells the story of you know right from the time the child was born from her labor pains onward and all i do is listen she just wants somebody to listen to because there is no solution to that issue and then i comfort her we do some cognitive therapy and then she goes back and she's back the next week so this is something called dysfunctional grief and you're just not able to come to terms you know it could be something that you feel you're blaming yourself for it could be something that uh, happened which is not in your control sometimes but we always feel that if i was there maybe i would have been able to you know probably not let it happen i know of a person who a very very close a relative who uh, committed suicide and sometimes i always think maybe if i was there would i have been able to stop it i don't know but this thought keeps coming to us and every one of us you know as doctors when you're you know, sitting there and thumping a person's chest or when you're like you know um uh, when you're trying to revive this person and the person passes off you think like did i not do something that i should have done did i maybe if i had you know held on a little longer maybe if i had thumped that chest a little longer a little more uh, ventilation and if you know even if there was asystole if i had continued maybe the person would have lived i don't know so this doubt i think all of us as doctors have it okay and then we have what is called as anticipatory grief and this pandemic has seen a lot of anticipatory grief so we start grieving before it occurs you know that the patient is out there and um, the lungs are completely gone multi organ failure person is in coma uh, covid is really hit them and we know the person is going to pass off but then you know before they pass off we start grieving for them we start getting anxious we start getting worried you know and particularly uh, all the frontline workers have experienced this that you know that person out there bed number 4 bed number 5 whatever is going to pass off and then we start anticipating that next one please so the next style of uh, grief is called disenfranchised okay here you know this is this is we as doctors okay we don't open, openly uh, acknowledge um, because it's socially sanctioned or even publicly shared okay we don't want to uh, recognize a sense of loss and we develop guilt feelings inside okay but we are pressured to get on with life and this is typically of all of us doctors medical students where you have this tip of a lip and uh, you know you still feel terrible about it but you don't want to talk about it because it might upset other people also the men in our society you know uh, men are not allowed to cry okay so if a man loses his wife he's supposed to be stoic you know baki sab log reng nahi nahi you don't cry and the first thing if you noticed you know when your friend is crying or something we put our arm around him and say don't cry okay uh, we say don't cry which is actually the dumbest thing we can say to a person who's crying because we feel guilty when we say ha koi baat nahi ro lo now in my clinic i always say when somebody starts crying we say i'm so sorry i said nahi please cry this is a place it's a safe place the door is closed nobody can hear you cry if you want to howl howl but get it out of your system but we don't do that because we are uncomfortable when people cry we don't know how to react we don't know what to say there's never the right thing that we can talk when somebody uh, experiences a loss so we just say hey nene matro 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 don't cry it's okay don't cry right and we force a person to kind of bottle their uh, grief uh dekho sab log dekh rahe bacche dekh rahe you know all kinds of idiotic things we say to people who are crying uh, so we stop them from crying and it you know kind of builds up into a complicated grief reaction okay so here we are we're talking about a complicated grief so um the length and the intensity of the emotions almost seem to go on forever okay um, the person's response is very maladaptive like for example you don't want to if you lost your husband you know you just say no i don't want to go and talk to other men or say if you lost a child you know whenever you don't you refuse to go to a park 
you refuse to go to work you refuse to take a shower okay there are people who maintain their children's rooms for almost 20 to 25 years they'll go and dust the toys the child used to play with you know um, wash and iron the clothes or the school uniform and it's all over the room so you just don't want to forget so that is what is called as complicated grief reactions um they're very very overwhelming uh, it can lead to post traumatic stress um and this is something that needs immediate um, and prolonged psychiatric intervention the next one please intervention sorry um we've done that yeah and then we have what is called as chronic grief i think all of us are chronic grievers like um, we you know grief for people 10 years 20 years 30 years we keep grieving for that person particularly and see in our culture also we have a very elaborate grieving um, rituals to make you grieve you know first day second day third day fourth day all until the 12th day and then you have um, a, a monthly ritual for the first year and then you have a yearly ritual and then you have during the shara there is you know for uh, there is a time where you uh, give uh, um prayers to your um, dead and uh, gone and even in islam and uh, christianity there are periods of time where you pray for you know the uh, dead and gone so we have elaborate such rituals that you know make sure that you know the grief becomes uh, minimized and that you know you're given a chance to vent your uh, frustrations your anger your angst your sadness you're given a chance to do that okay and then we have what is called as mask grief again we are all that you know we wear this mask we wear this mask okay and uh, we are grieving but we don't show it um sometimes it's delayed like i know of a, uh, a lady who lost her father 15 years ago and she started crying all of a sudden uh, 15 years later and there was nothing to provoke that uh, crying there was nobody else who died or nothing so all of a sudden she just remembered her father and started crying and she had seizures it was very very uh, deeply overwhelming um and she just said that maybe at, at that time i was only earning member of the family and i had to earn i did not have the time to grieve and now i'm settled and maybe it's just coming out in that in some form it's always been there and i have always kind of squashed it now it's come out the next one please So we have what is called, you know, we, uh, you know, in mental health, we want to, you know, classify everything and, you know, find, try, try to understand because, you know, mental health itself is such an empirical science that we need, you know, we need markers for everything. So here we have uh, Kubler-Ross uh, who defined the grief cycle. I'm giving you the five stage grief. There is seven stage and nine stage also, but that's more complicated. So the first thing in, you know, is, is denial or oh, it's not happening to me. Like say your doctors and then you tell a person, okay, I'm sorry, you have cancer. What what rubbish? That report must be wrong, right? No, no, no. I'm I, no, and that that's not me. That must be somebody else's. I'll go test it somewhere else. I'll go to another doctor. You're a lousy doctor, right? Then you have anger. How could it happen? What the bloody hell? I mean, what are you talking about? Why is it happening to me? Okay, and no, no, no. This this is terrible. No, you. you know, I hate God. I hate this. I hate that. I hate everybody, right? And then you go into the bargaining stage. Okay. You, you struggle to find meaning, you know, or reason to why, why is this happening? And okay, let me try and understand it. And then your little bit of blaming also happens where like, oh, I shouldn't have smoked. Maybe that's why I have lung cancer. Or maybe my neighbor used to smoke and I used to sit there with him and have chai. Maybe that's why I have it. Right. Uh, you know, and, you know, uh, we also have this past life thing where we believe that uh, in our past life, we were, uh, uh, we done we we've sinned or something like that and uh, that's why we are uh, uh, experiencing this in this life so we have all kinds of uh, you know bargaining that we do with god okay why god take me and you know leave that person let me die take my life instead and leave that person all kinds of things okay and then we go into a deep depression um, where we feel overwhelmed we feel sad we feel you know um, we feel hostility we we want to socially withdraw from others and then slowly the stage of acceptance comes, okay? Where we say, okay, this person has died, now what? What do I do with my life next? So there is no time frame for these stages. Each person experiences these stages in different ways, but everybody experiences these stages. Uh, there's not a single person who, who doesn't experience these stages. Next slide, please. So I'm just quickly, um, you know, uh, 
giving it as from an illness perspective but since you're all medical students and doctors um so from a from a from an illness perspective so like i just said somebody says you have cancer so they say the tests are wrong can't be happening to me don't believe it okay and then um see we as healthcare workers should just listen without confirming or denying just listen and say i'm sorry this is probably happening can i see the report or would you like to get it tested again that's the maximum you can say to them but you know a non judgmental listening is what you should give them first the next one anger so they they are angry they blame the doctors you're a lousy doctor you're this you're that hospital is horrible i must have got it from the hospital you, you know all kinds of things okay um i know of a person who um was um, diagnosed with hiv and then he said mai roz chicken khata hu na isliye so you are in denial plus anger you do, you know where it came from okay and he was definitely a sexually active person with a lot of visitor commercial sex workers and all that so he knew his behavior but he was in denial there and in anger okay and aap sab log doctor you know the needle which you gave me the uh, which took the blood test must have had aids so anything you know anything but you know that's that's anger it's usually irrational okay and um, please uh, as medical students you need to understand that this is not anything personal so when you're working in uh, in the wards when you're doing your ward rounds somebody might just attack you for no reason at all and you know i know many people who burst out crying or who get very angry and shout back at patients but we need to understand that this is not this is not personal at all sometimes when people write shit about you on google it's not personal it's their frustration that's all and we need to understand this the next one please so then you start bargaining okay you accept death but you want more time you know um, what can i do then that's when the lifestyle changes turn in all your life you have not done those lifestyle changes but now you will okay so people keep badgering the doctors tell me what all i can do can i drink this can i have karela juice can i have uh, apple cider vinegar anything to you know prolong then there's a naturopathy homeopathy all kinds of uh, alternate medicines see which is fine i mean i i do believe that you know we as allopaths should open our minds and say okay if you want to do something spiritual go ahead you know i always say you know dawa or dua dono chalne do you know don't stop my medicines but you do whatever else you like if somebody says can i take you know can i consult a homeopath absolutely if you want me to talk to that homeopath and tell him your symptoms i'll be happy to do so okay as long as you don't stop my medicines i'm cool with whatever you want to do and i think that is that approach has always helped because uh, we in india we love alternate medicine we never believe in allopathy we always believe that it has a worse side effect okay and that they are more disease producing particularly people who are going in for chemo particularly people who are on arv all of these people are you know and now even the people who get uh, corona they just believe that uh, you know a, a, any alternate medicine will help them and a lot of the deaths in villages have been because of that they've gone to mantrik or they've gone to faith healers they've gone to you know ayurvedic people who claim who make uh, you know claims that they will help uh, so these are the things that uh, and then you know you keep making you know all kinds of promises to god mai bal dunga mai ye dunga wo dunga i'll, I'll feed 1000 people but that's the that's the bargaining that we do with our lives the next one <coughs> and then we go into depression which is again um particularly when a person is uh, approaching uh, death um and i i speak uh, mostly about you know cancer patients here because this is something where you are actually anticipating you are actually waiting for it to happen and that's the horrible um, uh, truth of you know chronic uh, debilitating diseases like autoimmune disorders um you know chronic diabetes people who are on you know crf with you know with dialysis you just literally looking at a path that says you know you're not coming back from there and um, they you know they want to have fun you know they'll have a bucket list and they'll say okay mai yahan jaunga i'll do this i'll do that and unfortunately you know family is such a dampener here they say no 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 you're not well you can't go no 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 you're not you know i would always say like give them the best life possible if you feel that they have 3 months you can make it 6 months by just giving them a better life it's of being you know having morose faces and have people visit and say how did this happen we are so sorry we are doing this this puja that puja ha karo bhai like and go out with this person have fun with this person okay and we as health uh, workers should understand and anticipate depression in fact with most chronic debilitating disorders um, it is mandatory to uh, have uh, an antidepressant on your drug regime okay mostly for cancer patients for all people with chronic debilitating rheumatoid arthritis 
we do give. In fact, I'm a lupus patient and um, my doctor asked me, do you get depressed? And I said, no, I think I have mania as a problem. I think you need to <laughs> tone it down and not give me an antidepressant. So, you know, um, um, I do believe that uh, a lot of people with autoimmune disorders come to me and I have slipped in an antidepressant for them, usually a sertraline or uh, any other SSRI which suits them so that they're able to take you know, the diagnosis better and it actually prolongs the um, life, the um, quality of life, the duration of life and also how they face death also. They, they become a little more accepting of, you know, the um, entirety of and the, this, the, 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 the fearsomeness of the diagnosis. The next one, please. Then, of course, they go into acceptance and then that's when, you know, praying to God happens and then, you know, you try to atone for your sins. Um, we go, you know, slowly we go further away. Some people say, let me go to a hospice or let me go to some ashram. Or I, I want to, you know, die in a temple. Okay. And this is the time when they need the most emotional support because that's when you think they're, they've accepted something, they actually haven't. Okay. So this is just their way of, you know, so this is the time when they need the most uh, psychological guidance and support. The next one, please. So these are all the common reactions to grief. The physical reactions would be loss of appetite, weight loss, weight gain, fatigue. Um, the libido would have gone down, decreased immune system responses, uh, decreased energies, headaches, stomach aches. The next one, please. Uh, then you have behavioral where you have forgetfulness, you feel withdrawn, insomnia or hypersomnia where you're sleeping too much. Um, dreaming uh, of the diseased person or dreaming of yourself being diseased and people carrying you to your grave and you know very uh, dramatic dreams then you verbalize your loss or uh, you know verbalize an impending loss a lot of crying uh, loss of productivity you're not able to you know do anything you know even something simple as you know brushing your teeth sometimes becomes a big chore the next one please the emotional um, aspect of this is anger anxiety sadness guilt shock uh, numbness, loneliness, fear, power. You feel powerless and that's the scariest thing of all because we all like to be in control, isn't it? Uh, we like to think we control our clothes, we try and control our lives, we control everything that happens and we get very upset when things don't go as planned. So this sheer powerlessness, you know, of uh, the event uh, is what scares you. Then um, helplessness. You feel like, okay, what could I have done? Recently, I lost a neighbor and a very, very dear friend. <coughs> Came to me with a headache, sent him to an MRI. He had a resurgence. He had prostatic cancer before resurgence. He had a glioma in his head and there were a few metastatic lesions after 10 years. And he was doing very well uh, on chemo and they were going to give him one last intensive chemo. And he spoke to me that morning. He said, Purima, I'm going. I'll see you in two days. And I said, Aunt, he get a biryani khayenge tere ghar mein. And uh, the next thing I know, he passed away. The shock and the disbelief and the powerlessness um, was was uh, something that was so overpowering because I've known him for like donkey's years and all of a sudden, you know, this neighbor right next door is not there. His family's there and they're dealing with it and everybody's shocked because nobody thought this would happen. Um, he had an extreme reaction to the last chemo, he had a heart attack while it was going on and passed away. So it was a, it was a you know, we, we deal with so many of these things and this is somebody I know, okay, and what if it is somebody you don't know but you still, you know, you want that patient to live and you always blame yourself because we as doctors, we our main motto in life, the Hippocratic Oath says, we're going to save them and we're going to push our lives to be, you know, in the service of saving people. And, you know, we take it so seriously, particularly all you youngsters, you take it so seriously that you want that person to survive and then they just pass off. And uh, you feel terrible about it. And this is the sheer powerlessness and helplessness that we doctors, you know, experience mostly. Of course, everybody else also, but we as doctors, we experience this the most. The next one, please. So then we have cognitive where, you know, you know, you can't concentrate, your judgment is impaired, you have road rages, driving issues, you know, you don't break on time, you have accidents, um, obsessive uh, thought of the lost uh, person or object, you're preoccupied with, you know, other thoughts, um, maybe about how to plan our life, we're confused, uh, we question all our, you know, spiritual beliefs. I know of a person who burnt all his uh, idols. He was a, actually an idol collector, um, brass idol collector. And he had about 2,000 in his house. He burned everything when his son died in an accident. So, you you know, you question all your spiritual beliefs. Stop going to temples. Become an atheist. Okay, sit there, you know, reading, you know, books on philosophy, death, dying. 
um, and searching for purpose and meaning in pujas and in our scriptures. So these are all the cognitive, uh, there are a lot more, but I'm just putting the main ones here. The next one, please. So then we go into what is called as uh, PTSD and uh, CPTSD is complicated PTSD. Uh, basically, you know, what it looks like is, you know, we avoid thinking about the trauma. We have flashbacks and that's the scariest part. All of a sudden you have a flashback. Um, you might have nightmares. You can't concentrate. You have a lot of negative thinking, um, difficulty falling asleep or even getting up from sleep, uh, feeling a lot of guilt, although you didn't do anything. It's not your fault. Somebody somewhere has passed away, but you feel guilty for it. There's a negative mood. Um, okay. And you're always on guard. You feel something bad is going to happen. So you're always on guard. Loss of interest in life. And um, as I said, the nightmares. The nightmares can be extremely scary. Uh, so this is uh, uh, complicated. And complicated PTSD, wherein you know, the flashbacks almost happen throughout and there are uh, profound psychiatric symptoms like depression. Uh, it, it can be uh, very paranoid. Uh, so there are profound psychiatric symptoms in CPTSD. The next one, please. So how do we deal with grief and bereavement? So this is uh, the most important thing because whether it's in our personal lives or in our professional lives, grief and bereavement are things we need to deal with. And like I told you, it's not only about death or dying. It's not, it's, it can be any loss. It can be the loss of your puppy. It can, it can, it can be, uh, you know, a plant that has died. You know, a, an elderly person who's, you know, living alone, tending to her plants and one plant dies. It's as good as losing a child. Okay. So for me, losing a dog is like losing a baby. So uh, I can never get over, you know, a death of a dog or an animal. If I see an animal suffering on the road, I, and I actually feel grief. So for me um, and for everybody, there's always something that we're attached to. Okay, and we need to learn how to deal with it. The next one, please. So here, I'm going to introduce you to this term called resilience, where resilience means like, you know, it doesn't mean that you're like a pillar. Okay, but it just means that there are certain things where you can do to build, you know, some defense mechanisms that will help you uh, take care of, you know, these feelings of, you know, helplessness, powerlessness, and all the effects that I have told you of grief and loss. So the first thing is self-awareness. Who am I? Where do I stand in the schema of life? And how am I going to uh, take this forward? Mindfulness, that you know, you're, you practice certain areas of mindfulness where you're concentrating on certain things. You're able to uh, let go of certain things. Breathing exercises, meditation, self-care. Now, this is the last thing that people bother about. You know, taking care of oneself. We are so busy taking care of the world. So staying adequately hydrated, eating properly, sleeping well, taking some time out for yourself, doing things that you like, all of these is self-care, which I think all of us neglect. Um, then having positive relationships, like say, uh, talking to people who will listen, talking to people who are non-judgmental, this definitely helps. Then making a purpose in life. Okay, fine. So there are so many people who say, who have autistic children and they say, okay, this is my purpose in life and I'm going to school, open a school for autistic children. I'm going to help more children like mine. Or say a person, uh, I know of a person who has uh, opened um, a clinic for uh, animals because her, her pet dog died. So everybody, you know, we try to find a purpose in our lives. And sometimes the loss of something in our lives can actually give us purpose. The next one, please. So there are, uh, these, are these are the stress resilience skills. Uh, like I said, you know, self-awareness, attention and flexibility and stability you know of focus so the thing is we have to learn how to be you know stop being rigid in our thinking become more flexible and strive for stability this i think is definitely a therapeutic goal that we, we need to there are some people who can do it on their own by reading self-help books and all that but this is definitely a, a therapy related goal okay letting go of the physical and also letting go mentally mentally again is a therapeutic goal okay accessing and sustaining positive emotions uh, again, there are a lot of people who are able to do this you know, from Google and all that. But uh, um, I think this is a therapeutic goal again. The next one, please. So these are the medical and therapeutic interventions since everybody here is a doctor. The first thing is medical management, antidepressants, anxiolytics, sometimes an antipsychotic if there is CPTSD or you know, profound uh, PTSD. So we deal with SSRIs, we deal with the 
um, you know, clonazepams and all the, uh, the diazepam group of drugs. And many times, if you notice uh, today, there's a lot of nutritional management. So eat right, um, supplement B12, supplement D, supplement all the uh, fat and uh, water-soluble vitamins. They definitely have mood restorative uh, properties. Then we have what is called as RTMS, which is basically a trans uh, uh, magnetic uh, stimulation, which is a non uh, invasive uh, uh, stimulation where you have, you know, um, stimulation that occurs on the various sides of the brain, which is very good for uh, uh, PTSD, it's very good for anxiety and depression, of course, OCD also. Uh, then you have electrocalamansal therapy for people who are suicidal, extremely violent, who have had psychotic episodes because of the grief and loss. Um, there are people who don't come to terms with their, uh, and it, it can be, uh, you know, in uh, CPTSD, we can have a psychotic episode. So for such people, sometimes ECT, electroconvulsive therapy is a treatment. It's not something barbaric as a lot of people think. A lot of medical professionals also think it's barbaric, but no, it's not. Uh, it's actually uh, a established a form of therapy. Then we have a lot of counseling strategies, uh, such as solution-focused therapy, and we have acceptance and commitment therapy. This is a very, very good form of therapy. Um, it is like a takeoff. If, if uh, CBT is, you know, the grandfather of uh, all these therapies. And then, we, of course, we have uh, cognitive behavior therapy. We have bereavement therapy, mindfulness. There are a lot more therapies, actually, you know. We have a, what is called as a brief dynamic therapy, which is like the older therapy based on uh, the psychoanalytic um, therapies. So we have a lot of these therapies, uh, transactional analysis, all of these things where we question um, uh, the the irrationality of a person's grief reaction. We deal with you know their cognitive bias. We deal with their cognitive uh, issues, and then we we do what is called as cognitive pruning. We make people accept you know that their uh, their irrationalities or their thought process, and then we we try to make them think you know empower them to think in a different way. Again, so therapy does not mean telling them what to do. Therapy means empowering them to do what they can. The next one, please. So these are the you know positive coping uh, strategies, and this is something that every one of us needs again, again as uh, doctors. So be patient. Each person will go through their grieving process at their own pace. As I told you when I was teaching you the Kubler Ross uh, uh, stages, everybody you know will go through the stages, but at their own pace. Um, talk, ask for help, particularly youngsters. You know if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, please ask for help. You know do one thing at a time, take one day at a time. Take a break if you want to. Sometimes ward rounds can be horribly traumatic. So, you know, talk to your buddies, go sit in the canteen, um, you know, just try to, you know, just have some fun, you know, have a collective Netflix uh, binge watching session. It will definitely help you come out of these things. Um, uh, when you when you watch on Netflix also, try not, when you're in this mood, when you're feeling overwhelmed, try not to watch uh, too many overwhelming uh, uh, psychiatric dramas or police dramas or murder dramas. You know, or, you know, these vigilante dramas, try to, you know, keep it light and keep it interesting. Uh, please take help. Talk to your friends. And if that's not helping, take help. There's nothing wrong in taking help. And here we are talking of stigma here. But uh, thankfully, today, over the past five years, I've been in practice for 30 years. Over the past five years, thanks to uh, you know, Dr. Google, uh, a lot of people are coming with awareness. They come with the diagnosis also, and I really don't mind. If somebody says, I think I have OCD, I say, oh, really? Tell me about it. And I'm willing to listen. So I think, you know, keeping an open mind, uh, people do come for help. Uh, eat healthy. Um, journaling is, is, I think, it's the number one thing that we all say. If you can't bring yourself to write on certain days, just put in some keywords which you can fill in later. Get plenty of rest. Um, exercise in any which way you can, whether it's going for a walk or, you know, even walking to the canteen is exercise. Okay, but don't lead a very sedentary life. Participate in enjoyable activities. Maintain friendships. Do something nice for another person. Um, this this is a, a mindfulness exercise wherein you know you just feel good when you do something nice. It can even be you know buying some khichdi for a roadside beggar, you know anything that will make you feel a little good. Um, practice stress management techniques like deep breathing, visualization, um, other stress management techniques like you know clenching your hands and letting go. You know you can do this hard and let go. Take a deep breath, five seconds in, five seconds out. Do all of these things that are positive, that will help you cope with the situations you're in and the situation that you'll be dealing with. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, even consoling a person who's experienced a loss can be extremely stressful and overwhelming. And we are all in that position where we need to put an arm around a mother who's lost her son 
or you know an infant who's died and a mother who can't come to terms with it so all of these things you know we absorb a lot of negativity so this is for us actually more than the person who's feeling it i think if we are okay i think they are okay the next one please so these are all a few healing exercises um so it says you know spend time on your hobbies radical acceptance of your feelings this is a very tough thing huh? it's just there so easily put it's a very tough thing radical acceptance of your feelings even your negative ones uh, practice self forgiveness because this is very very important and of course forgiving others um, when you're doing forgiveness you also do your gratitudes it can be something as simple that you know today it did not rain or you know the weather was good in uh, pune so something small like that also you can just say you know i'm great i'm grateful for that um cultivate as much as possible you know uh, you know you can uh, some positive uh, aspects of your life reach out and help people reach out to take help okay find your passion every one of us has a passion we just need to find it because we are so overwhelmed with studies and exams and marks we forget that we have a passion so please and if your doctors make your money you know make your profession your your passion uh, it's not about earning money it's about just enjoying every day of your life Uh, so when people ask me you know like you're always in your clinic what is your life and i say this is my life and i enjoy every minute of it so if you think of it as a or you know i'm sitting here and look at me in the casualty when i should be in goa no you will find time to go to goa also but when you're in the casualty every, enjoy every minute of it um it create an emotional outlet it can be a friend it can be a podcast it can be you know a, 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 having a blog you can have a secret blog um practice you know positive coping skills like eat, like i said again eating well sleeping well uh, going out and being with buddies who who help you um going out sometimes alone you know it's wonderful very cathartic go to a shop or something and just you know bum around a mall eat something alone it can be very cathartic um practice self care you know take your time i mean you know there's no hurry to um, heal nobody tells you that if you have this time frame 5 minutes mein heal hona chahiye the world will tell you stop crying 5 minutes and you get you know you'll get a lot of gyan from people oh what's what's wrong just snap out of it you know all you need to do you're just lazy leading a lazy life you're din bhar so reho people don't think that you know depression is something that um, uh, you need to deal with like a fracture but you know because it's invisible all our feelings and emotions are invisible nobody pays much attention to them so ignore all these you know this this gyan bato uh, walas just ignore them people who give free advice you must never take it okay let go of your past first come to terms with your past and then let go of it talk about your story if you feel that somebody will listen talk about it write about it blog about it right um when you look at it you know physically the, why we uh, mental health professionals make you write is because of this when you are talking about something sometimes you might miss out the details but when you write when you look at it it becomes very objective okay uh and this is my favorite it says rediscover who you are and not just what you want because who you are and what you want may be two different things okay so healing is is a journey it is not a destination there is no destination called healing it's a huge journey okay and um, you keep gaining you know uh, as you walk on this path of healing you keep gaining many things lots of experiences lots of you know lots of insights um you never reach a destination as such and these things should not have a destination because once you feel that your healing is complete then you know the next trauma is waiting just around the corner so let healing always be a journey the next one please so please remember and this is for all of us here you can be happy and also feel sadness uh you can make mistakes and also succeed you can sleep a lot and still be productive that's me and uh you can be a beginner and still provide a lot of value to others okay you can have a partner but you must love yourself the most you can fall in love and also be vulnerable okay um if you if you want to fall in your uh, fall in love remember to fall in love with yourself the most and um always remember to work on yourself okay be strong and but also be vulnerable being strong does not mean you have to turn into a rock okay uh you can be criticized but still do something important and epic and um i think when when we have all the haters around us and we have you know whether it's on media social media platforms or whether it is anywhere else we need to realize that you know these are emotions that we can live by these are things that we need to understand about ourselves so that you are able to deal with trauma deal with loss deal with anything that happens around you the next one please
I think this is my last slide. Ha, so this is my last slide. Um, so we all need to cultivate a little bit of emotional intelligence in the form of social skills, self-regulation skills, motivation skills, empathy. Empathy is something that doctors have to have to learn. Okay, and it has to be the difference between sympathy and empathy because if you're sympathizing, then you're not a doctor. You'll be sitting and crying next to the patient, which I did when I was a, when I was a medical student and I was a surgeon. Uh, then I learned the meaning of empathy. Now I feel, I, I put myself into their shoes and say, oh, that must be such a terrible thing. Okay, uh, try to practice equality to the best of your ability uh, not, without prejudice. Um, that's not on this, but I'm just telling you this without prejudice. Let's not be gender prejudiced. <coughs> so right now we have a very wide um, angle of uh, vision for the lgbtqia so please don't be prejudiced or if you are prejudiced it's up to you but put your prejudice aside when you're dealing with the patient it doesn't have to reflect in the way you treat your patients or the, the way you treat the other person and um, um, your own self-awareness all of these things if you're self-aware then you'll be aware of other selves also it opens your eyes, you know, you have a third eye here, you know, which opens and um, you become aware of other people and where they're coming from. Before you react emotionally, just think of where they're coming from. So a person who's screaming and shouting in the ward, he's just lost his daughter. Okay. Um, while I never condone um, violence towards doctors, um, because that's mob behavior. But when a person is screaming and crying and sometimes probably abusing the doctors, it is his loss that's making him do that. So try to understand for a moment, stay safe by all means, because nowadays it's all the age of mob behavior. Stay safe, but uh, please be aware of other people's emotions also. And that constitutes our own emotional intelligence, which gets fed by all our experiences. So uh, this is my last slide. Thank you so much for having me here. I hope I've been able to shed some light on uh, uh, grief and loss. Please remember that grief and loss uh, have nothing to do with death or very little to do with death. And grief and loss is something that we as medical professionals and you know, health providers uh, experience a lot of. And we go into a lot of trauma and stress. A lot of doctors, if you know, senior doctors would just pop an alprazolam before they go to bed because they're so stressed out. So if you as youngsters are able to deal with your stress better, you don't need to reach out for that alprazolam or clonazepam. And, um, you know, you would definitely have a more enriched and fulfilling lives, both for yourselves and for the profession that you've picked. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was wonderful insight from you. And I'm sure everybody watching, you radiate such positive energy that I'm sure everybody watching feels like they can achieve any feat in their lives. I know I am taking back a lot from the Thank session. You. Uh, any, or everyone who's watching, everyone who's tuned in, guys, you can leave your questions in the comments down below and ma'am will be very happy to answer them. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll just ask a few questions that I had prior to the session. You have covered uh, the topic of grief and loss very extensively and uh, very nicely. I just have a few questions. Sure. Uh, so ma'am, as you uh, said, grief has five stages and uh, they form the very framework of um, us learning to live with what we've lost, be it yes. a thing or be it a person. So is it yes. necessary for every individual to go through all of those five stages and in that particular order? So most people, actually, this is something quite unconscious. Okay, so we are not conscious of what we are going through. But yes, it usually goes in that order and that's the reason why it's there. There are, you know, there are other stages also but um, and the duration of each stage is not something we know so we don't know how, like somebody may be angry for a longer time some people may be accepting for a longer time so we don't know um, how how long each stage will be but they do go through these stages and uh, it is uh, something quite um, actually quite amazing to realize that there's not a single person who doesn't go through these stages and it's not a conscious thing at all. They might consciously try to suppress the stages so that you don't get to see it. But everybody goes through these stages. And um, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of, uh, you know, this um, uh, research by Kubler-Ross, where he said that uh, um, however we feel uh, grief, uh, we will go through these stages. Okay, there are a lot of people who start listening to the Bhagavad Gita and all of these things. Um, so the the... the um, 
style of uh, how you go through the stages is individual, but the stages are for sure. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so another question I had was that there are so many people, like you said, uh, mm. grieving is a very individual experience. It's very subjective yes. from person to person. So some Correct. people may stay in the anger stage for a very long time, others in depression or that. So what would you say to people who feel like they'll never get over their grief? Yes. Uh, so so what one thing is, you know, we call this as complicated grief. Uh, and uh, see what happens is uh, that we sometimes don't want to let go. As I told you, there's a mother who's been maintaining her son's room. You know, for, for years on end, it's exactly the same way the toys he used to play with. And had he been alive, would have been in his 30s now. So we don't love, we don't want to let go. Okay. And that's the reason why, you know, all our scriptures, you know, whether it's the Bible, in the Quran or, you know, the, the Gita, it always says that, you know, you need to let go. Uh, unless you learn to let go and say, okay, this has happened. And um, none of us are, you know, uh, no, none of us. Uh, could have stopped it you know we did feel powerless and helpless and there's also something called survivor's guilt you know why did you know like particularly during the uh, covid times you see survivor's anxiety and survivor's guilt oh, why did that person go why did i survive particularly when a parent has lost a young child to covid you know young you know in in their youth so um, when we are dealing with these kinds of grief um, some people don't want to let go and the, the idea of a therapeutic intervention itself is to teach them to let go, to accept, and to now reframe their lives. You know, without this person, the memories will... I always tell people, you know, I can not take your memories away, and I don't want to, but I can take the sting and the grief away, and I can make you plan your life uh, in a way that is fruitful to you, and that, you know, the person who is deceased, uh, who's, who's not there with us, would still be proud of you. So think of that as a positive thing and, you know, two things that would make that person proud of. Try to fulfill a few of their dreams and uh, maybe that will make you feel better. And that also adds to the healing process. Thank you, ma'am. Um, another question I had was at the very beginning of the session, uh, you spoke a little bit about how uh, mental health of children is not focused enough on. And uh, suppose I had a very similar experience myself in that when you're little and you lose some, you lose a very instrumental figure in your life, then there is so much uh, going on around. You're not able to focus on your, what your grief is and your emotions. So I wanted to ask how do children grieve differently than adults or how different or similar is the process of grieving uh, for children than adults? So when, when you're talking of children, though the stages are almost the same, the expression of those stages are very, very different. For example, a child's anger would be a temper tantrum, would be screaming, okay, or throwing things, which we, we as adults don't have the luxury of, okay. Uh, for example, a child going through denial can just have make an imaginary playmate who is the person they lost, okay. So they have imaginary playmates. For example, I was there was this uh, TV serial which I saw where, you know, uh, a child loses uh, his toy and he was extremely upset by that. And uh, so the father sneaks in and gets the, the exact same toy and said like, okay, look, um, I, I found it in the garbage uh, heap. You know, you by mistake, you might have thrown your toy. Here's your toy. But then, you know, the child says, no, this is not my toy, you know, because I know there are marks on this toy which don't belong. So then the father says, so what? You have him back. You have, you know, the child toy's name is Arnold. Right? You have Arnold back. Why don't you? Um, so he says, no, you just got me another toy. It's not Arnold. Right? For, so for a child, so even say if a mother say remarries or if a father remarries, okay, you're getting a mother figure, but it is not your mother or a father figure who's not your father. So these are, you know, real emotions in a child which we need to prepare children for. Okay? Like I said, for a child, even something really small can create a huge grief reaction like i said a toy tearing or a, you know their favorite cup breaking or dropping food on the floor it would have been their favorite burger it's not that they can't get another burger it's just that at that moment you see that the the sense of loss is very high which is why we are you know in a stage wherein we um, feel that whenever we lose something you know the permanence of it scares you okay and which is what we need to talk to children about 
that okay this person is not going to come back so whether they have gone to santa claus or you no know, depending on the age of the child we say either they gone to god gone to child, um, santa claus whatever right whatever we tell the child it has to be plausible it has to be believable and that concept has to change over time the concept of death is something that uh, a child needs to understand and that's a very scary prospect okay so losing a parent is far less common than losing a pet losing a goldfish okay so uh, you have to get them used to the concept of death and say okay fine the person has gone to god but here we are and we are uh, um, we are experiencing this loss right now and we are all grieving for this so let's give it a beautiful grand burial so there you know you you put flowers and you know dig a small grave for that goldfish so make a ritual out of that also so when a child goes through an elaborate grieving ritual and they understand the loss and people are uh, a sympathetic and you know are empathizing with the child the child will you know find it easier to come out otherwise you have things like bedwetting you have you know like you know while aneurysm they also have oncopresis where um, they in, they poop in their clothes you know a toilet trained child might poop in their clothes um, they start head banging uh, breath holding spells okay having uh, psychological seizures you know like a conversion reaction so all of these things are very common in children and it just it's just like a cry for help it's not like they're you know they're dying to make trouble for you which most people around get irritated with it's a cry for help and it means that the child needs an active intervention particularly if the child is autistic particularly if the child has you know maybe downs or you know uh, uh, dyslexia or any of these where they are far more vulnerable to these kind of emotions yeah i was just coming to that ma'am since we're talking okay. about care <laughs> care giving in an unequal world and you have extensive experience with the uh, children and adults on the neurodivergent spectrum yes. so how does care giving in such cases differ what is what is the grieving process like uh, so when we are talking of say a child with adhd uh, the grief may seem more short lived because a child is you know like all over the place uh, but it's not short lived they are not able to focus on it right now but they'll keep focusing on it in fits and starts instead of focusing it out for an hour a day they might focus on it for you know like 15 minutes 10 times a day <coughs> or 5 minutes 10 times a day so their grief is not any less than other grief just because they are not crying like other children when we are talking of the autism spectrum okay any of the and any of the other neurodivergent uh, Uh, disorders. Uh, there are two things that a person they may not be very conscious of human emotions. They'll they'll watch the mother cry, but they won't know why she's crying. So they might get disturbed because the mother's crying, but they don't understand maybe the concept of death. They would probably cry more if you know uh, one of their toys lost an eye or you know the hair came off, um, or if they broke a toy, rather than the human being in front of them. So people tend to disregard this kind of uh, this kind of uh, behavior because. they feel that the child doesn't understand the child understands it on their own play they're different label they're not disabled isn't it they're different label so to take a child through the grieving process the mother has to pay a lot of attention and you know keep pointing to pictures of the father and say no he's not here anymore he won't come back you know things like that it make a concept permanent because for them you know they're concrete thinkers they're not uh, they, they they don't have abstract thinking so they say okay if you see daddy he's there if you don't see him he's not there so is he going to come back when is he coming back <coughs> so dealing with those questions can be traumatic for the adult also they constantly repetitive and asking when is my dad going to come back when is my dad going to come back right so it can be very traumatic for the adults so i think at that time what we we suggest is a shifting of you know caregiving like okay sometime the grandmother takes care then the grandfather takes care cousins take care you know or maybe you can leave the child with you know in a safe place with friends when he's out of that grieving atmosphere but yeah then he understands the uh, concept of grief in a non grieving and a non challenging atmosphere all right ma'am um coming to a few final questions uh, so ma'am we're from a very culturally diverse uh, country yes and yes while the grief and depression they're universal emotions ideas to respond to these emotions are very, are highly culturally specific Yes. so uh, i was reading a few days back an article that uh, after the apartheid in rwanda uh, a few western mental health workers uh, were posted there and they were uh, conducting their daily sessions the uh, psychotherapy session and the rwandan public was not res- responding to it 
and they were completely shunning those people uh, aside and when asked the rwandan people said that we're a community you know we like to be out in the uh, sun we like to get our blood flowing by singing and dancing and they have their own elaborate rituals about how to deal with grief so very mm. similarly we have a very culturally diverse um, background and history but mm. in a country like india with little to no mainstream focus on mental health where uh, mental illness or anguish is considered deviant or an act of the devil uh, mm-hmm. and we've seen that happen over the past how uh, people still lack basic mental health awareness so how can we sensitize the general masses about the vulnerability of loss and grief so so the first thing we need to understand is uh, a lot of our grief rituals our grief and our expressions are um, very societal and cultural based okay so if uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, tribes in africa they believe in say you know hugging each other talking to each other holding hands right so um, you know uh, the ubuntu uh, uh, concepts you know where they try to give each other comfort to get out of the situation and there lot of laughter and gaiety because they also believe that the soul is lingering around and if they show grief the soul gets confused so they try to let the soul go you know with a lot of happiness and a lot of you know gaiety and laughter for us also in some of our cultures we have that it's not that we laugh when a person dies but definitely we try we try to you know comfort each other by you know uh, and our elaborate uh, morning rituals itself you know which transcend religion and culture um, they they all last for about 30 days 15 days you know like that and uh, during which time the person is constantly talking to people there are always people coming to offer their condolences talk about this person it works a lot for some people to to catharsis and talk you know uh, so this person was good that's what happened this is what happened and uh, such things you see they are very cathartic and these are the things that help so in our culturally neuro, neurodivergent uh, um, uh, sorry not neurodivergent the culture culturally uh, divergent uh, population see i think each person uh, and each culture has got their own way of dealing with it i know of a person who went back to work the second day after her father died and she was very close to her father okay and we will said like she is not even crying so then she said like i don't need to display my grief and for me getting back to work is the only way i can get him out of my mind otherwise i'd probably kill myself too you know i would probably do something very drastic just to be there with him you know wherever whichever world he is in right the other thing is we have uh, concepts of heaven concepts of you know a better place crossing the rainbow you know where we want to believe that this person is free from suffering and is in a better place okay so this is also a very comforting thought saying that okay the, the mortal remains um, we are uh, sending them also sending them also back to where they should be in a much happier and a healthier place where sickness does not exist sadness does not exist so we have created a world now whether it really exists or not is anybody's guess but we have created this very happy place for a person who's passed away to go to okay so that's also very comforting thought instead of lying in bed with paralysis or any chronic illness they have gone now they are happily running around and fooling around there with 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 their friends so it's a it's a very comforting thought so all of these things if you notice this is this exists in every culture though the cu- cultural practices may be different but the basic commonality of you know uh, dealing with death almost you know kind of has a parallel thank you ma'am we have a question in the chat box uh, pramod says that letting go most of the time is very difficult and uh, i suppose a temporary replacement of the leaving object is usually beneficial just to have a deviation uh, and he would like your opinion on the same yes i completely agree letting go is the most difficult thing on earth and all the objects that you've lost are not immediately replaceable like in a relationship you know you sometimes people get into another relationship on the rebound okay just to have somebody in their lives and that can be i think the worst thing that you can do both to yourself and the other person who's entered the relationship so i think you have to give it some healthy time space okay and it's okay if you are obsessively thinking about that person go through your denial go through your anger go through your stages okay whether you're conscious of it or unconscious of it and over time you know you will you will you know see a path 
or you will you will make your own path that says okay now um, i need to divert my mind from this so let me do this 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 let me concentrate on my studies or let me get back to my work and start you know or let me go out with my friends let me talk to my friends they all know uh, what i'm going through so let me just get them together and let's all go out somewhere let me plan a short vacation for myself so there are coping strategies that we can plan once we go through you know what we call as you know the the process of loss the process of loss uh, like i said it can last any amount of time but with a little bit of active mindfulness and you know seeking help seeking therapy if you need you know you can definitely come to terms with where you are the last question from my end ma'am i'll stop troubling you after this no no um, <laughs> recently i came across a quote by uh, helen keller she said that uh, we bereaved are not alone we belong to the largest company in all the world the company of those suffering and i thought that this couldn't hold any more true than in a post pandemic world where all of us have experienced very significant yes. loss yes yes um as a very layman as a layman as just somebody's because most of the time we fulfill the capacity of the person comforting a, a person who is be, uh, yes. grieving so how can we as a friend relative partner or family help someone who is sometimes too deep in their sorrow to even identify their own needs so can i say something here i'm going to quote from one of the most uh, odd sources okay uh, and that is course, from um, something which i posted on facebook many times and it's by winnie the pooh okay so winnie the pooh the little piglet <clears throat> finds out that winnie the pooh is you know winnie the pooh is the personification of depression in our modern times okay uh, tiger is the manic depressive guy and piglet is one of those quiet philosophers okay so he just goes there and uh, he realizes that pooh is in a bad mood so he just says okay what are you going to do i'm just going to be there with you so sometimes you know uh, i i so relate to that even in my therapy i so relate to that that you know sometimes just a quiet presence you don't have to you know go there and mark your attendance at a funeral or mark your attendance at the pujas and all whatever rituals are going on there but you can just be there and say okay do you need food uh, you know the, the essential you know take care of a maid um, you know take care of the house when the person is grieving make sure that person is eating well you don't have to say a word you can just say i'm just plonking myself in your house for the next few days okay and you don't have to say anything comforting or anything motivational or any of these things okay just be there with that person and you know take care of that person and i think that's the greatest help we can do sometimes you know even even therapists you know when you feel facing your own personal loss we don't know how to comfort ourselves or others you know death is a a, a very difficult thing you know we don't know what to say to comfort that person so i have done this myself you know but i'm just around any time you need me i'm just right there i'm outside your room okay i'm reading my my book doing my own work okay but i'm just there so if you just need to lean if you want to hug me and cry i'm perfectly fine with it you know if you want to talk i'm 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 there to listen even if you've said the same thing a million times i'll just listen without saying aha uh-huh, you told me this let's move on to another topic right so a quiet presence uh, i think is priceless and a person who listens these days in in modern times we don't have anybody who listens that's why people turn to therapists so just a ear that listens you know and two hands that hug if necessary i think that's the best thing you can do to help a person thank you so much ma'am and that is a wonderful note to end on uh, for people who are grieving themselves just as ma'am said knowing that it is a long journey and just discovering yourself and being in touch with your emotions and for people who are near or supporting ca- characters in somebody else's uh, film of grief uh, like you said just being there and listening uh, thank you so much ma'am you, thank you. again i think again you radiate such positive thank vibrations you. and energy it really thank i'm you. sure it makes us all feel like we can overcome thank anything thank you uh, so just coming to the end of the session i want to extend my generous thanks to dr nagaraja thank who has spared time from a hectic schedule to provide her with to, to provide us thank with you. this wonderful thank insight you. um and thank you so much ma'am for your support and cooperation throughout the entire process of scheduling this webinar and then conducting it today we're very happy to have you and we'd love to have you back thank you and i just wanted to say that i'm always around if anybody wants to talk to me 
or if they want to you know like message me or something like that i'm always around you can pass my number around to anybody who needs help it's all completely right, free because you're all doctors to be so it's a completely free um service that i'm extending to all of you anybody who wants to talk or you know just get their doubts cleared i'm always around i'm Thank always on so. whatsapp i chat i chat very well well late late into the night <laughs> when you kids are awake <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, also, I'd just like to extend my thanks to all the participants for uh, tuning in on a weekend morning on this Saturday morning. I'm sure, ma'am, has made all of our times worthwhile, and it was a pleasure listening to her. But thank you to everybody for attending this session, and uh, we have uh, we have upcoming webinars, panel discussions, and workshops regarding uh, various subjects of mental health. and uh, please make sure that you fill the feedback form that is in the chat box and that is the way we will be recording your attendance uh, lastly i would just like to thank the entire team at switch india for making this entire conference possible it's not possible to thank everybody who has shown such appreciating involvement and the willingness to conduct this much needed conference it is very uh, jarring to just think that we have all of these mental uh, we have all of these medical and research conferences happening all around the year and we don't even have one summit or conference where you know we can talk about this much needed uh, subject of mental health so thank you to everybody who's organizing and thank you to ma'am for sparing thank her time so and coming today thank you ma'am thank you thank you so much